Next, we've got uh, Morgan Gay. She's a food, food futurologist. Um, she looks at food and eating from a social, cultural, economic, trend, branding, and geo geopolitical uh, perspective. Um, she also develops new ideas for food-related TV programs and does research on all, en all elements of the eating experience. Um, so, welcome, Morgan. Time piece up here. Um, just going to wait for this to. Ah, here we are. Okay, so as a food futurologist, I'm really privileged to live in London because um, the UK is one of the most trend driven places probably in the world. Uh, that's because we are so disloyal and always looking out for new ideas. We're very aspirational. And food really is a bit like design or uh, fashion. It's changing and we're always looking for the newest thing because we like to think that we're cool and we have something clever to say. And what food says about us is really powerful because it's a real indicator of who we think we are, who we'd like other people to think we are. It says a lot about our beliefs, about ourselves, and about the moment that we're living in right now. So if we look back at photographs of ourselves perhaps 20 years ago, maybe you had a perm, you were wearing something that you're probably embarrassed to wear right now, and you look back at photographs of yourself and you probably laugh and think, that's a bit kind of, I really thought I was the greatest thing, but it's kind of embarrassing. But we look back at foods perhaps from the 70s and we can see things like Arctic roll or Findus crispy pancakes, probably in that kind of in that kind of arena of something that now doesn't seem so she she and cool. So talking about eating our way to the future, and it says twelve things, but it might not be twelve; it might be less because I haven't got a lot of time. So I'm going to probably rush through. Um, these are the drivers, really, that I think are quite key for what's happening right now. So, of course, the economy with loads of prices rising. Right now, we're in a bit of a recession, but I think from my research that we're going to start into a, a bit of an expansion by 2015. So things are going to start looking a bit brighter and we'll start to choose foods that will start to reflect our perspective in that time. Environmentally, everybody's aware of all the concerns that we have. And also geopolitically, our age, uh, our ageing population and birth rates are always changing. And those three things tend to really affect what we eat and how we think about what we're going to eat. So for the first thing, um, going, we used to think about purity and goodness uh, being white. So we had a real stretch uh, in the early 2000s where everything was white and pure and clean and good and that meant health and, and wellness. But now we're going into uh, a place where it's about earth, it's darkness. Part of that is also because of our economic situation, but also about going back to the land of this whole, we've had this whole trend about foraging and, and lots of things around that. So this idea of romanticism comes in, and uh, we, s we see it come through in these kind of, um, with these kind of messages around the food itself. So we see lots of foods reflecting that, which are, tend to be black and dark. And these are some of the foods, for some reason, it, it, they run off, uh, everything's running off. Um, but we see things that are infused with charcoal, loads of flavours like licorice are coming in. A lot, often we start to see this already. When we start to see these emerging trends, they tend to be in like farmers markets or people uh, hear them quite in, an, in a niche place before they really hit the supermarkets or become something that becomes commonplace. Because of course normality is what we're doing right now and we don't really understand trend because usually we're in the moment and that seems like it's the most normal thing. When we talk about the future, it's always something that we either think, I'm never gonna do that or that's a bit weird. So I tried to make this a little bit closer to the moment so that we start to see this stuff coming into niche, uh, in sort of niche view and then we'll, e we'll expand. So loads of things with charcoal, black foods, black sesame, uh, squid ink, um, black corn, um, all these sorts of dark foods, black garlic, which you may have seen coming through. Then on the flip side of that is translucence. So although we think that, that one of the things that we see often with trend is that the sort of the equal and opposite is always true. So with all the idea around this darkness and blackness about being hidden, about being obscured, uh, the flip side of that is translucence and transparency. And we've really seen that come to light a lot this year politically um, with all uh, lots of different scandals coming to light. And also we see that playing out in food. Um, 
so uh, one of the examples, I mean, lots of things around chia seeds, which you may see already, which creates a gel. In, uh, you put it in a liquid, it creates a gel. Lots of bubble teas. That idea around transparency, clear foods. Uh, the the centre picture is the Richard Branson ice cube, if any of you have travelled in first class in Virgin. Um, that's what you get in your drink. Um, with this head embossed on every cube. And what that says is more than just, uh, look at me, I'm on an ice cube. But it also said... I'm a transparent person, the brand is transparent. There's lots of sort of messages that we're going to start seeing coming in that. And loads of creativity around ice, uh, shaved ice, uh, different kind of mouldings in, in ice cubes themselves and ways of using ice will come in. Um, lots of different clear bottles have started to come to the fore and, of course, the cold-pressed juices, which has become sort of the biggest thing right now, where they're using a different process to make juice, which, have, uh, which you may know yourself is that if you squeeze orange juice and you leave it, it actually the sediment settles in the glass, whereas if you buy fresh orange juice, supposedly fresh orange juice in a supermarket that's been pasteurised, it's actually just a suspended colour of orange. So we're really wanting now this idea of transparency and clear foods, and there's so much coming through in that. A thing like, uh, there's an object called gelatinas, if any of you know that dessert, it's from, um, it's from Mexico, and it looks like a paperweight, and it's injected from the bottom with a kind of um, icing, and you turn it out, it's absolutely beautiful, looks like a flower, sort of paperweight. But another example of these sort of desserts that aren't just a jelly, are these translucent um, objects that are going to come to the fore. The other, uh, the other way we're going is that idea of invisibility, and we see that a lot through social media where people are coming off Facebook, where people are wanting some anonymity and don't want to be tracked and don't want all of their information out there and ways of, of uh, preserving the self a little bit, so disappearing off grid, not going on holiday where everybody else is going to be, but going to places where we can really have a personal moment that doesn't have to be shared with the world. So we see, we see this coming in in food as well, um, where it always comes into fa fashion and food tend to always come together. Um, but we're seeing lots of branding ideas where there's, that's actually a non-branding. So we're going to see lots of companies starting to do that where they're taking their brand off, off, um, off the packaging itself. So something like almost you can almost identify it just by the shape of the bottle, but brands will start to f uh, find cleverer ways and almost... Um, show that they're unique and special by just stepping back a little bit. It's about the beige, it's about, uh, it's no longer this showy, blingy, um, out there uh, message that consumers want, it's something that's a little bit more hidden and closed down and speciality. Sharing is, is a massive thing and is becoming a bigger thing. Um, the idea that we have spent such a lot of time over the last 20 years closing ourselves down and having relationships that are possibly not human relationships, but relationships through technology. We're wanting more and more the human contact and that way of sharing. So, so we see that, of course, with all the farmers markets, with the events that bring people together via food. Um, Sydney Harbour Bridge on the far right was closed, uh, was closed down, and that's a Crave Food Festival. Um, lots of different, the, the idea of fondue, that 70s classic, the après ski food is coming back and there's loads of, uh, loads of fondue kits which will come to the fore, sweet fondues, the Korean barbecue of course. Um, I, places of sharing our produce, digital, uh, digital ways in which we can perhaps find people who've grown apples but have too many and they will just give, us, uh, give them to us if we can go and find them. So lots of ways of actually sharing our own produce and finding ways to create community through food. Loads of farming allotments, um, growing collectives and also experiential dining experiences where suddenly and more so we're going to start feeling that uh, food isn't a wonderful thing unless we're actually sharing it with somebody else. So uh, there's an example here on the left, uh, on the right, sorry, where people are actually wearing a whole tablecloth, a little bit like the hidden anonymity, but they've just got their head through the tablecloth and they're sort of having a dining experience with complete strangers. Um, another way of sharing is this Pantone. They've uh, created every single food in the Pantone uh, colour scheme and it's arranged in the Pantone uh, colour chart and people are sharing the experience of colour through food. So loads of different experiences and also religion and religious ceremony and us creating our own ceremonies, which as we know, every single ceremony always revolves around food. So we're going to be doing more of that and creating new ways of sharing. Texture um, is another, almost a, another response to the way in which we've, uh, we've really been driven towards this idea of flat screen, um, 
non-textured environments and non-textured experiences so that everything we want it, we want it to be flat and smooth and and uh, almost perfect and we're now putting that feeling back in so texture is what we're really craving we're wanting something that's embroidered that's embellished that's that's um, that feels like it has some meaning again and we're going to find that much more in food because I think we've gone we've almost gone to the edge of taste where it's bacon and egg ice cream or it's snail um, snail biscuits you know we, we want something now that's about the mouthfeel experience it's the one place that really hasn't been fully explored apart from popping candy perhaps um, so, so we're, we're always wanting this new USP. The con consumers always want, especially here, especially in the UK, we're desperate for the next new thing. And of course, the brands always know that, so they're trying to think of the new ways they can they can add that in. These are the gelatinous I was talking about, um, because of course, in that you've got the, the the jelly experience, which inside the reverse of almost like a cupcake, inside you've got the creamy. Uh, the creamy bite. On the right hand side is Celep Dunderma. If anyone's been to Turkey, this is. Um, this makes stretchy ice cream, which you can cut with a knife and fork and can completely stretch. And it's made from um, the celeb uh, part of the orchid, which is um, which actually translates into fox testicle. And is supposed to make you very virile when you eat it. But it's only grown in this small part of Turkey and it's a band for export. Um, lots of different things around texture, different mouthfeels. Spoons are being developed with different knobs and nobules and uh, different kind of pieces stuck onto the spoon itself so you have a different mouthfeel experience there's so much to say about mouthfeel because that's really what defines what we like and don't like how children are incredibly p picky and difficult about what they eat because their mouth feels much more heightened than ours as adults so we, we're going to lots and lots of different um, different areas in in texture and it's really opening up for new product development um, and I'm working with lots of companies around those possibilities and um, one of the pictures before that you might so just go back uh, um, was this uh, this I don't know how to describe it black thing in the middle and um, that uh, is inside it's sort of gel it's sort of a jelly and inside of it is almost like a, uh, a liquid that comes out and you put this in your drink and as you pour the drink onto it uh, it's, it sort of explodes into the glass and this sort of a, uh, it changes the texture the color and also the taste of the liquid that's um, that's put in it so some really interesting new things happening in food in that arena the on-the-go market is massive and expanding, and it's because we really we are now uh, looking at time as one of the biggest luxuries and also one of the biggest things that we really have to manage in our life. And so the to-go uh, market is really expanding to uh, accommodate that. And we're looking at multifunctionality. Uh, consumers are wanting much more for their money, much more for their experience. It's no good just having a sandwich. It's what will this sandwich do for me? So we're wanting the benefits of that. And there's loads of different ways that sandwiches are opening up. So whether it's the waffle witch or the naan witch, um, Fibo, fi the f fish dogs, um, Fibo, which is, um, I think it's coming up. Uh, this is the one, of the th the one of the machines is Fibo, which is, um, you might see in the Netherlands quite a lot, where it's almost hot snacks uh, rather than just cold sandwiches that they're developing into the hot snacks and loads loads and loads of different ways to use vending machines. Loads of vending machine technology and science, uh, scientific um, face recognition systems which can tell what we like, um, be able to give us bespoke meals on the go, bespoke, bespoke choices, not just any old thing, that, you know, a can of Coke and a packet of crisps. Oh, okay, great. Oh, my goodness, sorry, I knew we wouldn't get through 12. Um, one of the other things that's happening with the to-go is the two-step breakfast. We are, <coughs> we are uh, changing the ways in which we eat. We're also changing the time in which we eat it. So most people now don't sit down, have that breakfast, go to work, and then have lunch. Most people are having the two-step breakfast. So they start, uh, and you may be one of these people, you start in the morning, you might have a cup of coffee and pick up a donut on the way to work and then at 11 o'clock have something else and then the lunch time is extended so companies are looking at ways in order uh, to create and uh, accommodate this two-step breakfast where they're doing bagged breakfast so breakfast on the go where I think McDonald's are doing it there's some universities in the states that are doing it where they're giving you the two steps in the bag itself so you'll get a coffee a muffin some granola snack perhaps and something else an apple and a banana so you're getting quite almost like a picnic for this kind of on-the-go grazing that will go throughout the morning some of the bag breakfast there 
Um, prohibition and artificial scarcity. We are creating artificial scarcity because it gives the brand, it gives food more, uh, the more sense of feeling like it's something really valuable and that we want it. Um, so, so that, we, that you might see there's some donut shops or bread shops that basically, when it's gone, it's gone. So it might close at 11 o'clock and there's a queue around the block. And prohibition, which of course we're seeing much more, uh, started started with the uh, with smoking ban. We're going to see prohibition coming in and alcohol. We we the the, uh, the the fat tax, which happened in Denmark, is also you know showing that that governments are placing restrictions and we're being restricted. And we're going to see that. I think in um, they they did a they've done a ban in some workplaces in Ireland where people aren't allowed to wear perfume or deodorant to work because it's overwhelming. So there's some kind of prohibition coming in in lots of different ways. And also we'll be we'll be tested on on how we uh, how we recycle how we <coughs> use our food waste because we'll start to get taxed on that stuff. So. And so there's so much to say about some of the trends that are coming in, and I realise that I've run out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs>